Hello and welcome to the CIS Group of Schools ongoing Education Webinar 4.0 series. Thank you for taking the time out of your day and discuss some topics that are important to educators, parents, and students all around the world. My name is Ryan McClure. I'm a digital disruption expert at 2MC Digital, and it's an honor to field your questions today as the moderator. Today, we are going to discuss distance learning during COVID-19 with our esteemed panel of leaders from CIS Group of Schools. You have Kavita Jaisi, Director of Academics and Curriculum, Andrew Patterson, uh, Executive Head Teacher at the CIS Group, and Jen Olmsted, Head Teacher, CIS Pantai Inda Kapu, Jakarta. So ladies and gentlemen, let's start by exploring distance learning. What is distance learning? Because it's a pretty big umbrella. So um, for this question, I'd like to turn to Kavita. Could you talk a little bit about what is distance learning and how we define it academically? All right, thank you, Ryan. Um, distance learning is actually defined by the method where teachers and students are physically separated. Um, it's not a modern approach. It's been around since the 18th century. Now, back in those days, it used to be called correspondence education, where mostly people learn shorthand via the parcel post. Um, and then universities also started offering degree pro programs in absentia in 1800s. Now, it works the same way now as it worked before. So you have teachers sharing learning materials, they give out tasks, students complete the task and send the work back to teacher, teacher check and provide feedback and this process repeats. Now, why there is distance learning? There are two key factors, right? One is people's desire to learn. Everywhere people want to learn, but people may not have um, the flexibility to uh, do this learning in a face-to-face -face classroom. So there is this barrier that exists. The barrier could be distance, or you might have job to do, or you might have a family obligation that makes going to class very difficult. So what distance learning is over the years is, um, is a mean to make education accessible. So what, how it has evolved in the past 300 years since it started via parcel post is that it evolved alongside communication technology. So it started with a postal service and then it evolved to radio. Then there is the TV and now with the internet. Now it got more and more efficient over the years. Um, I think it's worth clearing um, the terminologies that comes, um, when you think of distance learning, there are other terminologies that comes to mind. So you think of distance learning when you think in the same breath um, of online learning. You might think of virtual learning. You may have heard of digital learning or home-based learning, right? So terms that you, know, you use nowadays interchangeably, but they are a bit different. So basically there's a before the internet distance learning academically, yep. and then there's mm -hmm. kind of like after the internet, yep. like distance learning 2.0 almost. Mm -mm. Three, four point oh. <laughs> yeah. So, so Kavita, is it fair to say that there is a post-internet world distance learning and then there's everything that came before? I think so. Uh, what internet did is that um, it made the word distance learning and online learning synonymous to each other, right? So in the past, I'm not sure if I should be using it. So this was distance learning. If you think of a Venn diagram, right? There's with distance learning and online learning might have been separate. But now, because most distance learning environment uses the internet, the, you know, it overlaps and the overlaps has gotten bigger and bigger, which is why, you know, we think of distance learning and online learning as the same. But one is the medium of delivering. Another one is really um, the location of where the teachers and students are. So the key differences are, are the location, the interaction, and uh, I guess the intention. 
you know, yes, you're right. Correct. So it sounds like um, the schools that are doing this right, and I'm assuming that that you know you're you're at CIS, you guys are doing this as well, um, is communicating with your stakeholders to to get a feel for the the network infrastructure, if you will, of your your mm -hmm. families, mm -hmm. uh, and then adapting the right uh, widely available scalable tools to do that that are already familiar, rather than run out and try and uh, learn how to use some new uh, ed tech tool, use the ones that are established, the ones that are already uh, understood by the, by the staff teachers and parents in many cases. And if yes. they're not, that it becomes a question of filling in the gaps, teaching the parents that, that don't have those platforms under their belt already, how to use them effectively. Yes. Yes, um, generally schools that do well, um, they do well in two things and, and they have these two things under control right from the start. One is communicating clearly with stakeholders because it's critical to over communicate because it reduces anxiety. Number two is getting all their basics right. And, and these are basics, right? Like class schedule needs to be up, you know having a standardized learning platform, use something that teachers are already using and are comfortable using, not just teach students and parents to are comfortable using, instead of at the moment of crisis, learn to use something brand new, right? Because that affects quality. Um, and also having a standard operating, operating standards across the school will make sure that things look, will make, things look like it is under control and this goes a long way to develop trust. Okay. Well, it's good to know that obviously, you know, CIS Group is a fairly digitally savvy organization. Look at us all here, uh, beaming out to the world. Okay. Well, Kavita, thank you for that. Uh, I think that that answered quite a few questions uh, for me. And I know that uh, many of the questions are around definition of terms. When it, when it comes to the uh, parents' questions and understand the difference between distance learning, which has been around for a while, and online learning. And uh, we'll get into a bit now with Andrew uh, around how is CIS kind of actualizing this online learning? What does this look like at the many CIS group of schools? Yeah. Well, it's been quite a process for us at the CIS group, uh, as in many schools around the world. And I guess, uh, as Kavita said, you know, as we started to realize that this, uh, this virus that seemed a long way away in China was getting closer and closer and more and more serious, we kind of realized, you know, around late January, early February, that this could be very serious here in Indonesia as well. And so we started thinking about uh, our response to that virus, uh, how, we would, how we would manage our schools during this time. And, and we developed, I guess, this, uh, this seven stage uh, response. Uh, and we're, we're a great, uh, great uh, group of team workers uh, here in CIS. And so all the head teachers and directors get together. Uh, we, we pool our knowledge and our resources and discuss how best to respond to these major things that happen you know, from time to time. So we had a bit of a discussion and some interaction and put together this, uh, this seven stage uh, plan so there could be a gradual escalation of our response as we got you know, more and more information as, as time went on. And so at one point in this response, uh, we knew that the government might order uh, closure of schools or we could decide ourselves to close the school uh, for the protection of our community. And so we knew that if we were going to do that, uh, then we would have to go to distance learning and, uh, and that would be a very major change uh, for our community. So I guess at first, to be honest with you, you know, in January, February, I was not convinced this would happen, uh, but it has. And, um, and it's happened very fast over the last few weeks uh, toward the end of March and, and early April. And so we are we're very glad that we did start to plan this uh, quite early. So, so we started talking about digital learning and, and how it would impact our communities. So the first thing that we did was to survey our parents uh, we, we need to understand what is the situation in the, the homes of parents, you know, across our community, because that's going to really impact what we can and can't do, you know, when it comes to distance learning. 
the, the, I guess the change as Kavita said was uh, moving from a school-based environment where you've got all the resources there, you've got a lot of control, you've got school bells that go on and off, you all know where to go at different times, you've got the library, you've got the teacher meetings, all those things are very established. A lot of allow, structure. Yeah, a lot of structure, you know, to allow a certain level of quality control in the school. But all of a sudden we don't have that anymore with distance learning. And so now we are reliant on the student and to some extent the parents or caregivers in the home as well. And that's a very unknown environment. So we did this survey of parents early on and got quite good, good feedback in all our schools. And, and one of the interesting things uh, that came out of that survey was that a lot of families didn't have a device per child in their home. So maybe they had one or two devices, but that had to be shared by two or three or four children in some cases. And we also knew that, that if we were doing distance learning, it's very likely that mum and dad were also home, maybe also working from home and also needed devices. And so you may have a couple of devices, but maybe uh, mobile phones, which are not that effective uh, for a lot of activities, uh, maybe not that many laptops. And in addition, we knew that the internet speed and connection would vary across the community. And it would be difficult in some cases for multiple conference calls to happen at the same time. So we got this feedback from parents that yes, some of them had one device per child. For them, fairly straightforward, fairly easily, good internet, uh, there wouldn't be an issue there. But a significant chunk of our community didn't have that experience. Now, the second thing that we found from that survey was that parents weren't quite sure how they would manage and look after their children if there was a forced shutdown, because many do work outside the home and maybe they have some caregivers that are part-time. Uh, they didn't know if they could be there all the day or just in the afternoons or just in the mornings. So based on this feedback, we realized, okay, we're gonna have to create a distance learning system here that is quite flexible. Otherwise, the people that have the one device per child and the good supervision in place at home would do fine. But a large chunk would really struggle. And the longer distance learning goes on, the bigger that struggle will become. And so, so based on that feedback, we've designed a plan that I think is quite flexible. And so it basically um, uh, was built around three different ideas. Number one, there is pre-recording of content from the teacher on video. And so by doing that, we can send that video, um, video teaching or demonstration to the students and they can watch it when they can. Uh, they, they can watch it in the afternoon or in the morning, they can watch it over and over again. So they are able to be flexible in the way they view that material. Unlike normal school, where the teacher comes into the classroom and then delivers the content live, to the kids all at once. So that's kind of the first thing that we tried to do, especially in relation to delivering new content, new information, new demonstrations, new skills uh, that are being developed. Now, the second part, I guess, of the, the three parts that we, that, we, um, that we have incorporated is to have a platform at each school uh, that allows seamless communication back and forth between the parent and the student and the teacher. And this is really critical because once again, we're not there live uh, to watch all those students and see what they're doing at all times. And so there must be good communication taking place. And so by having a centralized platform, and as Kavita said, there are many out there and all the, all the principals are getting emails every day from vendors trying to sell them these platforms. Uh, but but, we, but we, have, we have a selection of platforms that we use that enable the teacher to send those videos to also send content, web links, assignments, um, uh, and to enable back and forth interaction between the teacher and the student, but also so that parents can see as well. So parents are also in the loop as in terms of what is going on. So this platform is very important uh, to establish that good connection you know, between um, the parents and the students and the teachers. And the third part, I guess, of our distance learning um, uh, approach is to have this synchronous uh, live conference call. And this has now become famous around the world. I can say it, I think, online, famous Zoom conference calls that are happening everywhere. And these can be very powerful also because they, they create that real good engagement between the teacher and the student. 
you know, there is so much that you can do through video and then students doing an assignment and giving you the, the feedback uh, from the teacher. But then you also need that quick back and forward, the, the clarification, teacher asking questions to make sure the student understands. Uh, that also needs to be the case as well. And so these, these Zoom conference calls allow you know, all the students' faces to be on the screen and the teacher can then talk in real time and, and use that as an effective tool. Andrew, is, is it also, uh, you know, as a parent myself, I, I wonder, if, is it also a way to, to provide some structure around accountability as well? Because you see your teacher's face and she gets to ask you if you finish that assignment. Yeah, and that's especially important, I think, in the younger grades. Um, so, so, so there's quite a body of evidence around distance learning for secondary and, and university, but it's quite rare to have online preschool uh, and quite rare to have even primary school students doing a lot of online learning uh, for a long period of time. And so, yes, uh, ha having that contact with the teacher, uh, I mean, of course, using the platforms also enables back and forward communication. There can be online forums. You can message the teacher, teacher can message back. Uh, that can still happen. But yeah, the live, the live interaction creates this sense of um, relation, the relational um, connection is there. Uh, students don't feel quite so isolated. Uh, they, 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 it enables uh, a kind of sense of normality to be there as well. But the downside, I guess, of the conference calls is not very flexible. So students must log on at a certain time on a certain day uh, for, for that certain subject. And so by having these three different approaches, we've enabled the flexibility of the video and the, the asynchronous communication back and forward um, using the platform but then also a certain amount of the Zoom conference calls to keep that connection, to check for understanding, to make sure there's, there's good energy taking place in the classroom as well. Okay, well, thank you for that. Uh, my question to you now at a snapshot in time is, do you think education will go back to the way it was entirely or is the genie out of the bottle here? Uh, I mean, it certainly will go back to some level of normality uh, uh, once the, the virus uh, is under control. But I think that you are right in what you are implying here, that there is going to be, I think, a significant change worldwide. Uh, because people for the first time are now being forced to use technology they may have shied away from before. And we're seeing this even in our schools with our teachers, you know, as teachers uh, there are always some who are very tech savvy and want to try a lot of things. Others kind of reluctant, prefer the tried and true approach. Uh, now everyone has to do this. And so maybe for the first time, uh, teachers are gaining confidence and also students are developing some skills uh, in managing their time by themselves a little more, uh, managing different ways of learning. And I think that's going to be a powerful improvement actually in teaching and learning going forward. I mean, no one wants to stay in this mode for very long uh, because there are all kinds of advantages to having that live interaction in a school environment. But certainly there are powerful tools out there that can really enhance education and allow, allow a sense of differentiation between different kinds of students. You know, the students that go faster or, or need more time in their learning, uh, online technology can be very powerful for that. And so I'm, I'm very hopeful that out of this, um, out of this cloud, there is a silver lining to come in terms of the integration of technology into education. Okay, well, thank you very much for that comprehensive answer, Andrew. And we are going to field some more questions that uh, kind of uh, aggregate are basically asking, how do we keep the online distance learning that we're doing now uh, more fun, more engaging, more exciting? Uh, how do we keep it lively? How do we keep the students engaged? And uh, Jen, I'd like you to kind of elaborate on your thoughts on, on what are some tools we can use for this? What does the research say? Um, by all means. Thanks, Ryan. Absolutely. One of the really important parts of distance learning is, is to keep the kids engaged and excited. Kids need to come to class excited to learn every day. And there's some amazing programs out there. For instance, you can use Pear Deck and the children can communicate with their teacher through emojis. Do I understand it? Do I need more explanation? 
Uh, they can receive instant feedback through GoFormative. They can uh, develop their mathematical skill hierarchy through Ascend. And they can even listen to class readers through Scholastic. In fact, virtual learning has really changed the way we engage in our classrooms. It's far more exciting, informative and engaging. But this is the most important and the most exciting thing about distance learning is that it gives us the opportunity to go beyond the traditional classroom. And there are... <laughs> I'm really sorry, Brian. <laughs> Is that a cat? <laughs> a cat. That cat desperately wants to be in this video. <laughs> uh, Distance learning really gives us an interesting opportunity. It allows us to go beyond the traditional classroom. Traditional classroom has some limitations, and I'll just give you an example. For instance, in a class discussion, you can only check the understanding of, of one student. You can ask that question, what year did Indonesia get its independence? Only one child can answer. But in a virtual classroom, you can use Pear Deck or GoFormative and you can collect answers from students in real time to check the understanding of every single child. There's other platforms such as Ascend and this one is really exciting. So what happens is, is that the kids do a mathematical question if they get it wrong, Ascend marks it instantaneously, shows them how to do it correctly, and then gives them an easier question. Alternatively, if the child gets it right, then they'll be given a harder question. So what this program does is that it creates a personalized learning journey for the child. They're getting constant feedback and the program is getting constantly adjusted for their ability. These things are, are really exciting and incredibly innovative. And you used a really important word earlier, Ryan. You talked about transformative. We really have an opportunity to transform education. Andrew also talked about something very interesting. He said the teachers can make instructional videos. One of our challenges in the traditional classroom is that kids learn at different rates. Some kids learn faster than others. Some kids need more explanation. With an instructional video, kids can stop the video. They can replay it. They can listen to the explanation as many times as they need to. They don't need to embarrass themselves in the class by asking questions. And that is a really powerful way to help and differentiate, differentiate in the classroom, particularly for second language learners. I would imagine that, uh, you know, learning a second language, everybody understands requires a lot of engagement with uh, a tutor or coach, and that can still be done to a large degree with the online tools we have. Actually, it can be done better. So through GoFormative, one of the problems with learning a language is that you can only listen to one kid at a time. You say something, and then the kids need to say it back. How can you check their pronunciation? You can only listen to one child at a time. But this is the great thing with platforms like GoFormative is that the kids can all speak and you can listen to each child individually. And so it's much more efficient. In fact, these, these, these new platforms are, are incredibly powerful. So our challenge is to help our students adapt to new technologies seamlessly and easily. And so as we move forward to embrace our new reality of technology, I think it's really important to redefine our expectations of students and of learning itself. And learning can no longer take place simply between the pages of textbook. And learning must be fostering forward thinking culture of inquiry, collaboration and, and innovation. And if we want our students to be future world leaders in a world of technology, we must start here, immersing them in this world of technology. And this is our opportunity. This is our time to create progressive learning opportunities, to put our students on the cutting edge of an increasing digital world. And this is incredibly inspiring for us. This is a, a great opportunity for us to stretch how we learn, how we teach, and in fact, what education looks like itself. This is a, a really great journey for us to take. So it sounds like you see this as uh, at least the, the, the forcing of the hand to digital disruption here for education as, as 
essentially an opportunity to evolve uh, education alongside the technology that's, that's already evolving at a very rapid pace. Absolutely. And this is our chance. This is our chance to spend that time to look at new platforms, to look at new ways to teach and to learn. This is incredibly exciting for us. And, and Andrew said it really well. This is our silver lining. This is our chance. This is what we must grab with both hands. Well, that's inspiring. And, um, you know, just to, to go through a few of your points here, um, you know, I'd love to get a list of those tools, by the way. Maybe we can list out those tools that you mentioned in the notes below so everybody can check the, those out in their own time. But um, the tools that do exist now and that CIS, it sounds like CIS Group is using currently, um, sound like they're essentially scaling up the power of the teacher. Absolutely. And even when we go back to our traditional classrooms, we're going to be able to augment our teaching with these new tools. We will be moving towards blended classrooms. We're going to be able to take the best of the traditional classroom and the best of the, of the digital world in order to be able to create new ways of teaching and learning. Excellent. Excellent answer. Uh, and thank you for that, those answers, all three. And now we're gonna move into the Q&A session. So um, we've got uh, a few questions here from our audience. And I guess, Andrew, maybe you'd like to take this one. Uh, could you tell us more about that silver lining that you mentioned? Um, a little bit more about how this is going to potentially change things and what you're looking at in terms of uh, future opportunities to make learning more inclusive and engaging. Uh, sorry, Andrew, I, I'm unable to unmute you. There. Okay, how is that? That's better. Uh, yes. <laughs> Yeah, so a lot of these uh, tools that Jen spoke about uh, have been around for quite some time. I mean, there are more and more tools all the time, but there's been quite a few online tools. Uh, the barrier, I think, so far has been that not all teachers and not all students have fully embraced that. And so I think that uh, this crisis we're going through now is forcing everyone to embrace that. And so we will see more adoption of these, of these uh, online tools more consistently across the school. And I think also there's a greater self-belief now, you know? So I think now we realize we can do this. Um, it seems so scary for, say, for primary students to be more, more independently learning from home. But now we're seeing gradually, as time goes on, hold on, yes, they can do this. They can learn in this way. So that new self-belief will also be that silver lining. Okay, um, we've got another question here. Uh, what about the added stress for teachers, which I think is a fair concern. So what, would, what how are we handling the additional burden of change management and adopting these new, well, relatively new platforms uh, for teachers? Maybe Kavita, would you like to take a stab at that? And I think you've muted yourself too, because I can't unmute you. There we go. Can you hear me? <laughs> testing, testing. Okay, right. So, um, Ryan, you said about the added for teachers. Yeah. Is is there <clears throat> uh, the additional stress for teachers right now, since they're under oh. closer scrutiny and? Uh, they're having to manage change, they're having to manage disruption in their own yes, lives, yes, and also yes. help the students learn. Uh, well, we, we could expect, I mean, we should be expecting those additional stress to the teachers because first of all, not all teachers are tech savvy, right? And now that they are teaching online, um, trying to make videos, um, you know, trying to run um, classes using Zoom. For teachers who are not tech savvy, this is definitely additional stress and um, they would be um, very stressed about, you know, how they would manage this. And I think that's where teacher upskilling should be part of, um, the, you know, should be made as one of the plan as schools move towards doing distance learning. 
So there should be in the background teachers upskilling that needs to be done. So at SIS, we have a training department. And you know, we look at schools, we survey the teachers in all of our SIS uh, school group, and the training department comes up with programs that will teach teachers um, on how to use perhaps those different platforms and tools that Jen has spoken about. Um, and also tools that Andrew has spoken about, you know, to make sure that they are proficient in using. And number two is teachers are parents too. Sometimes we forget that, right? Um, and as Andrew has rightly stated, they are parents too. They are managing their home. They are managing their children. And at the same time, they are teaching online. Um, so that definitely would impact their mental health. And um, as schools that care. We need to make sure that um, we're always checking on them and making sure that they are well, they feel well supported through whatever means, um, you know, and giving them that feeling of ease by upskilling and by really taking care, showing care towards them actually goes a long way. So it sounds like uh, part of that, of course, is over communicating and then giving them some room to grow as well, not just dumping yes. out teaching hours on them, but making yes. room in their schedule for increased professional development to, to manage yeah. these tools. Okay, that's yes. great. Andrew, did you want to comment on that? I noticed that you signaled me. Yeah, just, just, just to add, um, this is one of the reasons why we, we start, tried to start slowly also, and we didn't want to introduce a whole lot of new platforms right away as we went to distance learning because not only do students and parents have to adapt, but teachers also have to adapt in, in, in a crisis situation as, as we find ourselves in, in right now. And so we started off with the very known um, uh, and the more familiar, and we are gradually over time implementing more and more of the tools that Jen and Kavita have talked about over the last little while. And so I think that approach has been very good for us. It means we can manage the communication well, get everyone confident in a certain area, and then increase over time. Okay, thanks for that. Um, we now have, uh, the questions are coming in hot and heavy. Uh, so how about this one? How is SIS, uh, and I'll, I'll, I'll throw this to you, Jen. Um, how is SIS uh, monitoring engagement of students during this crisis? That's a great question. So it's really important that students are excited to learn, that they're engaged in the activities. And so there's, there's different ways that we can do this. So every morning we Zoom with the kids during homeroom time. And the reason why we do this is because it's not just about their academic success, but at the moment with COVID-19, the children are very lonely at home, they're very frightened, they miss their friends. And this is a very, very important part of the online learning experience is for kids to not only engage in their schoolwork, but also to engage in their, with their friends and their community as well. And I think this is the biggest thing that we have lost as we have moved to, to virtual learning. And this is something that's very important to us. So we engage with the kids on a social and emotional level. Number one, that's the most important thing. Are our kids okay? Are they coping? And then the second thing is that we, we check their engagement through their, their academic success. So we can do that with a whole range of tools through Go Formative, through Pear Deck, where kids actually are in the lesson and they can actually respond in real time with the teacher. So they can get immediate feedback. Uh, teachers Zoom with the children and actually give lessons live online. That's a lot of fun and the children really enjoy that. And of course the children complete their projects, complete their classwork as well. Okay, thanks Jen. Um, I've got another question here that may be related, maybe evolved on that question. Um, Andrew, uh, do you think that the debate over online teaching or online learning, uh, paraphrasing here, will replace K-12 classroom teaching is now being put to the test? Is, does the answer lie in blended learning? Do you agree or disagree? 
Well, I don't think it's maybe as simple as replacing, uh, but like, like technology everywhere, it is transforming society in all kinds of different ways. And so I think no one knows uh, in the future how things will develop, but there is certainly a need to take advantage of technology and to integrate it more into learning and to utilize the power of it. And yes, we, we will see, I think, more and more opportunities for students to learn at their own pace and interact with teachers in different kinds of ways. You know, I don't think you can replace the teacher, uh, but what you can do is improve the communication between the teacher and the student. Okay, um, a few follow-on questions to that. Um, how do you know that parents are satisfied with the current online uh, distant, the online learning situation at CIS. How are you? How are you trying to test the waters there? Or is it ad hoc? Is there a system in place? Yeah. So, well, at some of our bigger schools, uh, we have what we've called uh, parent support officers. So we have got a team together of, of of people that are calling parents, contacting parents, asking them, "How is your experience? Is the technology working for you? Do you have any issues?" So teachers can focus on the teaching and other people can help with this engagement with parents one by one. So we're getting very personal and direct feedback, which we compile and talk about every day uh, because this is brand new. And so there's constant evaluation taking place. Where are the gaps? How can we improve things? How can we optimize it better? Uh, that's taking place in real time every day. Uh, I guess uh, at, at summer schools also, we are doing conferences just like this for parents. Uh, so, so large Zoom calls, where parents can ask live questions and hear our response. So we're really trying to make sure we hear our community. We know they're struggling. We know it's hard to manage, you know, young kids at home trying to do learning uh, while mom and dad are also doing their own their own work as well. It, it's challenging people under stress. So we're trying to hear that and trying to adapt to those needs as best we can. Okay, and well, we have time, I think, for one more question. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, Kavita, maybe you'd like to take this one. Do you make your students wear their uniform when they're at home online? If yes, why? If no, why? Oh, we encourage students to wear uniform. So it feels like it's a normal school day. You know, it gets them in the right, you know, mind frame. Um, so they know this is routine. I'm up. This is my study hour and I'm in my uniform. So it keeps that in that that learning mind frame um, so yeah I know schools at SIS that does that and it's really cute right when you see the young kids on zoom in their school uniform and even if they're working with their parents um, offline uh, when they do asynchronous type um, learning we still encourage them to do the same because I think it's it's you know it reminds them that hey we are still in the school hey you know this shouldn't feel that different. I know it's different, but hey, you know, we're all in this together. So we're all part of this. And they do not forget their identities. I see. Well, that's a fair number of reasons. And I personally miss my school uniform. It made things really easy at the start of the day. Um, so, uh, yes. Jen, Andrew, Kavita, Thank you for your time and thank you everyone else for joining. And uh, we'll hopefully be inviting you back for some more of these webinars that are addressing this transition we're all going through and our children are all going through. So to everybody out there and to our panelists, enjoy your Sunday and we'll see you next time.